Today we've got a little bit of an experiment to do on this PSB Alpha B speaker, which retailed for about $250 back in the early 2000s, you know, give or take. Now this speaker was loaned to me by a viewer. What's up, Keith? And everybody make sure to leave in the comment section below a nice what's up, Keith, for him sending this speaker out for me to just beat up and pulverize for the sake of our own education. All right, let's go. For as long as I've been on the forums talking about car audio and home audio and whatever in between, I have consistently seen pictures and a question supplementing it saying, this speaker cone is broken. Will it still sound fine? Should I get it replaced? And usually what the deal is, is somebody has dented a mid-range or maybe dented a tweeter or something along those lines. Now, my answer has usually been, yeah, you probably need to get it upgraded. And those are cases where it's pretty extreme. Now, if the dent or, or maybe just has like a little blemish or a little dimple or something like that, maybe it's not worth worrying about unless you bought it brand new and it showed up that way, then certainly get it fixed under warranty. But if you're looking for something kind of cheap, you know, used market, maybe it has a little blemish, eh, not a big deal, big blemish, get something better, okay? So this question came up recently and Keith said, hey, I can help you out. I'll send you a speaker that you can measure. You can do whatever you need to. You can beat it up. You can poke holes in this thing literally if you want to, and we'll see what the changes are. And rather than just giving you raw data, because that's what I'm going to lean into, I'm also going to provide you with some actual sound clips where I will take pink noise, and then I will take the convolved impulse response of the measurements of the speaker in its original form, just not busted up, but then also with a pretty messed up tweeter and a pretty messed up midwoofer. And speaking of that, let me show you what I did to the speaker. So here you can see it looks good, nothing wrong with it. I just pulled the grill off so I could measure it. And I really just needed to make sure that I knew where the tweeter was so I can line the microphone up to it to do the measurements properly. Then I went through a couple iterations. In this iteration, I put a dimple on the tweeter. And then in this iteration, I put a couple little dents in the midwoofer. Now, the interesting thing about this is when I came back from this third test with the tweeter and the midwoofer kind of messed up, I noticed that the tweeter had fixed itself. The little dimple that I put in it popped back out. Now, the way that I put the dimple in was with an eraser on a pencil. I just pushed in on it and creased it in. The sucker had popped back out. So basically that test was just on the woofer alone when I wanted it to be the midwoofer and the tweeter. So I had to run a four test and then I just really kind of pulverized the midwoofer and I put a lot more little dents in the tweeter as you can see here. But rather than go through all four of these sessions, I'm just gonna talk about the original performance and then the end performance with the busted up woofer and the busted up tweeter combined. Now let's go ahead and do the sound clips. I'm gonna play you Pink Noise. It's just the original track straight off the computer, okay? We'll play that for like three seconds and then I'm gonna switch over to the version where the PSB Alpha B uh, has been convolved with the pink noise. So basically what you're going to hear is what does the speaker do to the pink noise? Now, this is just the original. And then right after that for three seconds, I'm going to let you hear what happens when I messed up the woofer and I messed up the tweeter. Could you have picked the two different versions of the speaker apart in a truly blind listening test? Now, I told you on the screen which one's playing, so it's kind of cheating. And you most certainly notice the difference between the original pink noise, that just the non-altered one, and then the altered one with the frequency response kind of overlaid on top of it from the speaker. So those first two, you, you almost certainly heard a difference, right? But the second and third might not have heard as much of a difference. Well... So my thinking was, well, since it seems like it's probably only affecting the tweeter, why not high pass the pink noise on all of these above 6K? And that way we can focus more on just the high frequency and see if you notice a difference. 
So that's what I've done. And I will warn you, you may want to turn your volume down just a little bit more because all you're going to be hearing is high frequency and it may bother you. So don't crank it up too loud. Adjust the volume after these start playing, okay? Let's talk about what you just heard. Now, all of the data that you're about to see was captured using my Clippled Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data from a speaker in my garage in a non-anechoic environment like you see in this video. Now, the beauty of this is we take the room out of the equation and we allow ourselves to look at just the speaker. Now, some of you may think, well, what's the point? You know, like, it should only matter what I hear in my room. Sure, but as a reviewer, if my room is different from review to review or, you know, my setup changes and your setup is certainly going to be different than mine, then in my opinion, it's not very beneficial for me to talk about what I heard when we have to say, oh, we got to rely on our own ears or our own room. So having this anechoic data sets a baseline across all my reviews to which you can do legitimate comparisons to. So for example, you want to compare the base from one bookshelf speaker to another. You can do that with data. You want to see what the overall tonal differences are between two different speakers. You can do that with data. Does it tell you everything that you're going to hear? No, and I've never claimed it does, and I don't know anybody who does. But again, it's a lot better than me taking a wild guess as to what your setup is. Using the data, I can give you a better idea of what you're going to hear in comparison terms and also give you some suggestions on setup to improve your overall listening experience. Starting things off again, the CEA 2034 data set from the PSB Alpha B. And honest to goodness, this looks actually pretty dang good. This speaker cost $250 in the early aughts. I mean, this looks pretty good. The only thing to me that is a concern is this right through here, this boosted region, which is going to sound to me pretty dang sibilant. And in my initial listening, just to kind of sanity check these measurements, this certainly jives with what I heard. The overall directivity, it's not bad. I mean, again, even if I just take price out of the equation, the objective performance of the speaker is really quite impressive. Now, what happens when I go through the effort of messing up that tweeter and messing up the woofer? In red, you see those differences. So right now I'm just focusing on the on-axis response. Black is the original, red is the new messed up version. And then down here, we've got the directivity. So first of all, let's look at the on-axis response you see minor deviations in the upper mid-range, and that could be due to the mid-range being damaged. And then you see major deviations in the high frequency response in both on-axis and directivity. Now let's look at harmonic distortion. This is the unaltered version, and this is the altered version. And you may not have caught that, so let me go back. Unaltered, altered. And if I just overlay the THD, you can see that the altered version has an increasing distortion range above about maybe seven kilohertz or so above the original unaltered version. Now this isn't really a lot and there's a couple little deviations here and there. Ultimately, I'd say that this is a wash. What about the horizontal radiation of the speaker? As the sound is projected out of the speaker and ultimately into the room, what happens to the speaker when it's original versus beat up? All right, so this will be the original, and we've got some ballooning going on, which means that there's more radiation out to the side of the speaker between about two to four kilohertz, so that upper presence region. And then we've got some narrowing in this particular region, so that's going to reduce some sibilance in the lower sibilant region, and then it's going to peak them up in the upper sibilant region. Now, if we switch over and look at the damaged version, you'll notice immediately there's a change. But what was that change? Go back to the original, Aaron. I'm going back. Okay. So let's pay attention in this area right here, this upper high frequency area where percussive instruments are really given life and attack, okay? So go back to the beat up version. There we go. Really what this is telling you is that this speaker was initially pretty smooth and it tapered off as it got to the high frequencies like you expect most speakers to do that have a dome tweeter. And this one has a little waveguide, so it's actually doing a pretty good job. But when I go through and I dimple that tweeter, I really jack up that tweeter's radiation. 
So no longer is it kind of operating smoothly and directing sound more out front. It's just jacked up. So the sound that's coming directly at you and the sound that's shooting out to the side of the speaker is completely different. What about vertical? So if you sit with the speaker right at your ears, like right at eye level, lined up with the tweeter, in this case, your ear would be sitting right here and you'd be looking down this line and this would be above and to the back of the speaker and this direction would be below and to the back of the speaker. So if you go below that tweeter line too much, there's a hole in the response that really is gonna affect your, your dynamics, your attack in that upper mid-range area, your dialogue, clarity, things of that nature. And similar performance if you go too far above that tweeter. So the nominal performance is gonna be gained by sitting with your ears on that tweeter line. But what happens when we damage the tweeter? Okay, not a lot of change, not a lot. I'm gonna go back to the original. Focus in this area, because that's the biggest change. And I'm gonna go back to the beat up one. All right, so we see something similar to what we saw with the horizontal. Before the horizontal was getting jacked up going off the sides. Now the vertical is getting jacked up as you go above and below that tweeter line. This one to me doesn't seem to be as big of a deal, but that horizontal one is very interesting. This is burst decay. Now you've probably seen these waterfall charts and things like that. I don't like those. I don't think they're as useful as burst decay. Uh, for a number of reasons, I posted about this in my comment section before. So if you want to go back and look at that, you can. It's an old post, maybe like four or five months ago, maybe. But basically, what this tells us is when the speaker has a signal and then it no longer has a signal, is there any ringing? Is there a delayed tone of this speaker playing? So with the speaker unaltered, there is some delay in the upper mid-range area, okay? And it's, it's low in level, you're like 27 decibels down, so it's not a big deal. For the most part, this is kind of par for the course. Then you have some higher frequency issues going on here. There's some cone breakup or something of that nature. And that's kind of also typical for many dome tweeters. But what happens when I beat up on that tweeter, okay? Well, we get this, you get this goobly gobbly mess. It's just a whole lot of delayed ringing. And then if I'll just kind of point out some of the things that have changed, well, we see an increased upper mid-range decay time right through here, and we see a significant increase in the high frequency decay right through here. So this shows a very noticeable objective difference, but you had the opportunity to listen to the pink noise. Do you think you heard anything that might accentuate that? You know, it's subjective and it's there, but are you gonna hear that? That's a different question. So some really quick ones. What about impedance? Well, not a lot of difference in the high frequency, a minor little ripple here in the red version, which is the altered version. And then you've got some woofer stuff kind of going on here, which basically has just somewhat changed the tuning of the enclosure. Now, if I go to group delay, same thing. Actually, the group delay on the beat up version is a little bit less, but the high frequency stuff hasn't really changed. So that does it for this little study. And, and let me give you a couple little thoughts here to kind of wrap this thing up. First of all, I know, trust me, I know that this doesn't answer every single question about what happens when you damage a speaker cone, okay? But this is kind of an interesting little study into this. And what I've taken away from this, and it may be wrong, is that when the speaker, the drive unit, so the woofer, is playing outside of its pistonic radiation point, which is beaming for many of us, which is roughly about half of a wavelength of the diameter of the speaker, which in this case, for about a five and a quarter inch midwoofer, you're looking at about 1200 Hertz is kind of the half wavelength point for it. So beyond that, it's pretty much starting to narrow up in its radiation pattern. And then for a tweeter of this size, which I think is three quarter inch, it's gonna be like around nine kilohertz or so. So when you get above that beaming point and the non-pistonic range of the drive unit, that's when I expect that you're gonna start seeing more differences. Also, the more shallow the crossover is, especially for the mid woofer, I would also expect you to start seeing ringing and high frequency peaks and dips coming from that because it's not steep, which means that it has the opportunity to continue playing up higher outside of its nominal pass band. The other aspect to consider is a full range drive unit. So if you have a three or four inch or five inch or six inch, whatever drive unit that's playing full range, if you make indentations into that cone or the wizard cone or something like that, then you can expect to see pretty significant issues 
the further you go in frequency or the higher up you go in frequency. And I think those have a very strong likelihood of being audible, just like I do the case where you might have a midwoofer with a really shallow low pass filter. So it's, it's not rolled off pretty steep on the high end and it's allowed to play a little bit higher up than normal. I think those are cases where you're most likely to hear these kind of differences being made. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Hopefully I've answered most of them. This is not exhaustive, I know, but it's fun and it's interesting. And if somebody else wants to pick this up later, for sure, let me know and I'll do what I can to help you in your efforts. I didn't capture every single thing like multi-tone distortion and compression because I just didn't have the time and I got nothing else. So if you like what you see here, please take the time to subscribe, like, and leave a comment. That always helps me out. If you want to support what I'm doing, you can do so one of a few ways. You can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, or you can use any of my generic affiliate links in the comment section below or description section below. And by using those links, you can buy anything that you want and it earns me a small commission. So you can go to Amazon or Crushfield or Best Buy or Walmart or AliExpress or whatever, buy whatever you're interested in buying and that earns me a small commission and that allows me to keep doing this kind of stuff. So anyway, I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.